Our first story today is on the relatively new, expensive and often lucrative world of Wagyu beef production. When the Wagyu industry started here in the late 90s, many thought it a passing fad. But after almost two decades of investment, Australia now has the biggest herd outside Japan. And after years of relying on Japanese genetics to build that herd, the industry says it now has the tools to stand on its own feet, as Kerry State reports. Used for centuries in Japan as hard-working draft animals, Wagyu cattle have risen from their humble beginnings to become the haute couture of the beef world. When I first uh, looked at my first Wagyu and, uh, and I said to the guy who owned it, God darn, I said, these cattle are so ugly. I don't know how I'm going to go back to Australia and describe them. He said, son, they just look like money to me. Wagyu is, is very much the Louis Vuitton of beef, if you like. To paint a bit of a picture, when we first imported our cattle, they cost 25,000 US per head. Scott De Bruin is the president of the industry's peak body and runs South Australia's main Wagyu farm, Mayora at Millicent in the state's southeast. After buying 29 animals from a top Japanese producer in 1997, he now has one of the biggest full blood herds in the country with around 6,000 head. It's probably one of the fastest growing breeds in Australia. The Wagyu industry has very much been in an investment phase for the last um, 10 to 15 years, whereas now the industry has really become quite commercial. And this is where a lot of his investment has gone. A high-tech feedlot where cattle spend their final year fattening up after being introduced to grain rations in the paddock. Modelled on a European design, it automatically delivers the complex blends to cattle twice a day. The grain feeding process takes a, a long time. Um, so cattle are being grain fed for, say, 600 days and cost of grain is very high in Australia. Costs which are now starting to deliver some impressive returns. Ten years ago, uh, a carcass was probably worth, um, for a full-blood wagyu carcass, might have worth, been worth about three to four thousand dollars. Now it could be worth upwards to six to eight thousand dollars. This bit of meat alone would retail at more than one thousand dollars, and when it comes to wagyu, the money is in the marbling. So you hear a lot about marbling when you talk about wagyu. What actually is it? Marbling is actually these fine veins of fat which run inside the meat. So it's called intramuscular fat and it's like a street map of fat that goes throughout the muscle. I mean, it looks like there's a fair bit of marbling in this one, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So this is what, um, what's described as a marble score 9+. plus. So the marble score rating actually goes from 0 to 9, with 0 being the least amount of marbling and 9 being the most. If there's a real abundance of marbling beyond 9, we call it a 9+. plus. So with Wagyu, what you find is that, see all this marbling, you see as soon as it starts to go on the grill, because it's got a low melting point, it's already starting to dissipate through the meat. And that's what makes it so juicy. And seasoning isn't the only thing that enhances the flavour. What you feed the cattle is really important because it actually influences the flavour of the beef. We actually feed our cattle chocolate and it gives it a beautiful nutty caramel flavour. From flavour to getting the right type of fat in the right place, feed is at the centre of any Wagyu operation. High profile Victorian producer David Blackmore won't give away exactly what's in his, but says this ration is environmentally friendly. Everything that we feed is actually a by-product of making human food. Um, for instance, what's left over after making flour? What's left over after making canola oil? One of the main differences at his Alexandra property is that these leftovers no longer go to a traditional feedlot. Instead, they're delivered to a series of five-acre paddocks with around 25 animals in each. The cattle receive the same ration they did in the feedlot, but stay on grass. The fifth generation farmer swapped to this system a few years ago. We've been watching the animal welfare um, arguments and certainly 
um, animal welfare groups have got the public ear. You know, they've changed the chicken industry, they've changed the pork industry, they've changed the sheep industry, you know, mulesing. So um, they're starting to call feedlots factory farming. So we looked at that. We looked at ways that we could raise our cattle, you know, trying to make life happy for the cattle. Do they actually eat a lot of the grass? No, we sort of reckon it's probably about 5% of their, what they eat during the day is, is grass. And you really don't see them, you know, getting there and eating whole mouthfuls. It's just a nibble. The transition has run way over budget. And David Blackmore says managing the pasture is harder than expected. But he says the animals are performing better than ever, gaining more weight and maintaining a top marble score. I had a lot of knockers. They said they're going to walk too much. They're not going to eat properly. They're going to eat the grass. And on exactly the same ration as that we're feeding in the feedlot, we're getting a 20% increase in productivity. And the reason we think that it's done that is that the cattle lay down here all the time. Has it changed the meat? Has it changed the marbling? Has it changed the taste? The marbling hasn't changed. And I think our carcasses are actually softer than what they were. He certainly hasn't lost any business, with his branded beef on the menu of many of Australia's leading restaurants like Nobu in Melbourne. But neither the head chef here nor the producer have any plans to switch completely to grass-fed Wagyu. I think the flavour is still... It's, it's OK, but the texture of the beef is very different. They say Wagyu melts in your mouth, but the grass-fed Wagyu, it doesn't really melt in your mouth. However, there are a small but growing number of farmers who are pursuing the pasture option. From the highly regarded Hammonds in Tasmania, who added a grass-fed line three years ago, to newer players in the Wagyu industry like the Yarra Valley's Arthur Senior. We've tasted the grain-fed and it's a wee bit like baby food to me. And I like something to you put your teeth into and uh, enjoy. The experienced Angus producer says his approach, which balances fresh grass and some silage and hay, also adds regional characteristics to the meat. The grass feed's got more flavour and texture and is from home. Now it tastes like home. Nothing's brought in. All the grass, silage, hay, everything's made here. As for the characteristics that Wagyu is renowned for, he says the results are better than the sceptics predicted. Well, a lot of them said that we're wasting our time. We couldn't get them up to the weight. Uh, three and a half year old, they wouldn't put the marbling in to the meat. But we've proved them wrong. Uh, we're up about 680 odd kilo. And we're getting close on seven marbling score, which they thought we would only get about three to four. So we're pretty happy. Look, it's a niche market. Um, I think it's uh, everyone to their own. Uh, for us, we don't have the, uh, the ability to do that on the, on the broad scale that we are. From one of the smallest Wagyu operations to the largest in the country, the Australian agricultural company, or AACO, owns around half the national herd, with 43,000 Wagyu cattle on grain at feedlots in New South Wales and Queensland. I do think Wagyu is a grain-fed product. To bring out the full flavour and, and, uh, uh, and that taste profile, I think that needs grain. But with growing consumer interest in grass-fed beef, he says it's likely the company will branch out. We're certainly looking at every available marketing opportunity and I, and I think within the next five years that we'll have some sort of a, a grass-fed program. We already have a um, grass-fed grass program with the Burnett Downs brand. Uh, and I'm sure that the marketers would like to expand it into some sort of a Wagyu program. While feed is a vital part of any Wagyu operation, so too is finding the best animals to breed from. The local industry certainly got off to a strong start by importing top bloodlines from Japan. But that window was only open for several years back in the late 90s. So the genetics Australia has largely relied on is getting a bit old and it needs to find new blood in its own backyard. We had about, I think it was 17 foundation cows we had. These two are my favourites and back, left back. David Blackmore knows more about Wagyu genetics than the most. 
He helped pioneer full blood production in Australia, importing many of the embryos and semen from Japan. This 17-year-old cow comes from that original material. She's our best breeding cow by far. She's, um, you know, you can, we'd, we'd flush her every six weeks and she'd produce up to 30 embryos every six weeks. Um, she has actually got 2,400 descendants um, that have been born on our property. Those descendants are a blend of bloodlines because Wagyu covers several Japanese breeds of cattle, not just one. And the original batch of genetics to arrive in Australia included a bit of everything. You've got all these different strains that weren't being crossed in Japan because the prefectures protected their own breeds and their own bloodlines. I never had that restriction on me. Probably in the last 10 years they do this in Japan now. You know, we started doing it from day one. Detailed records are kept on every animal born on the property, from its pedigree to how it performs. And when it comes to improving cattle, carcass data is a big game changer. It's our major tool. There's a hundred tools, but that's our major tool is the carcass data. And that's what's increasingly being collected at abattoirs across the country. At this one in New South Wales, accredited meat graders spend the early hours of the morning among giant carcasses taking measurements. Special attention is paid to the amount, colour and distribution of the marbling. The single most important project that uh, the industry is working on right now is uh, the objective measurement of those carcass attributes which relate to value. While Wagyu producer and processor Pete Cabassi is getting a very clear image of those money-making traits, until now most of the industry has had a decidedly blurry view because it's relied on ultrasound scans of live animals that don't provide the full picture. We can't measure the marbling live with any degree of accuracy. We can only do it once the animal's been slaughtered. If you're not improving the productivity and the profitability of your enterprise, you are becoming poorer, and genetic improvement is the easiest way to fix that problem. Professor Rob Banks is at the forefront of genetics research in Australia's livestock industries and is now working on improving the productivity and profitability of Wagyu. He's using carcass, pedigree and DNA data to produce a range of new breeding values for around 10,000 cattle by the end of the year. And these ones are all about eating quality. Ultrasound scan is only about 20% as accurate for ultimate carcass marbling as is actually having the data. So in simple terms, they're going to be five, five times more accurate than they can be using ultrasound. That means they're going to be able to make much faster progress. That includes knowing which animals to breed from and which ones to send to the feedlot, something which has been more of an educated guess for many in the past. As farmers, we're quite often attracted to the larger, bigger volume bulls, the ones that grow really fast, like this guy just here. Um, but quite often what we find is that the bulls with the moderate growth, um, the ones that we wouldn't actually be selecting, are the ones that are proving to be the best bulls. So that smaller one in there is actually a better bull, is it? He's a better bull. And I can give you a great example of um, when this really came to fruition. Is uh, Four or five years ago, we had a group of four or five bulls. And of those bulls, one of them was by far the smallest. And he really phenotypically looked like a bull that we didn't want to keep. Um, and uh, we actually has him designated to be a, a cow bull. Now, um, by the graces of God, he wasn't sent off to the, to the abattoir, and he actually turned out to be our highest value bull. And his progeny are worth, on average, two and a half to three thousand dollars more than any other carcass we produce. Just slowly, just slowly. Just let him turn around, he'll turn around. Not only will the new selection tools prevent good animals going to waste, they'll also help producers identify them earlier. 770. It takes us seven years for us to prove a bull, and we're proving our own bulls. I'm 63. I don't have too many lots of seven years left in me for the generations coming forward. One of the things that really gets me a bit excited about genomics is that maybe I can do that in seven days. 
And whether it's a bull or a cow, finding a good one is a license to print money. While Japan keeps its own high performers in-house, David Blackmore is among the local breeders who exports Wagyu genetics. Today, 17 of his cows are being flushed for embryos. Each one collected sells for $1,000, and he averages 10 per cow. I've been interviewed by three different Japanese television channels in the last four months, and certainly the last two of the interviews, um, they've been, well, all of them are talking about brand Japan. They're talking about what we're doing with Wagyu around the world. They're saying that Japanese farmers um, are missing out um, by not allowing any more genetics out. While there's money in exporting genetics, the main reason producers are in Wagyu is to sell the meat. Most of it goes overseas, with Asia, the Middle East and the US the major markets. But this dry-aged beef is being sold locally at a specialist Wagyu butchers in Brisbane set up by producer and processor Pete Cabassi. I'm very interested in you know, people seeing a lot more Wagyu presented beautifully and, and interestingly here in this country. While he specialises in full blood, up to 95% of Wagyu beef sold in Australia comes from crossbreds. And some producers say that's not always obvious on menus. There is many, many different market segments. I mean, we've seen Wagyu subways, you know. Um, I don't know how much percentage of Wagyu was in them, but they were cheap. And then you see Wagyu at Nobu restaurant in Melbourne. Our Wagyu on the plate is selling at $1,060 a kilogram. So you've got all these different market segments all the way through. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's really going to be really, really important, though, that the customer is, is informed in what they're buying. To clear up the confusion, the industry is introducing naming protocols that encourage all players in the supply chain to identify different grades of Wagyu. It's something that's really been done through the livestock industry and all the people that produce, livest uh, produce Wagyu cattle, the, the growers, the breeders, the feedlotters, it's something they talk about all the time and it's using the same terminology that the producers are using all the way through the marketing chain. They may be considered inferior on the plate, but when it comes to profitability, these crossbreds are a match for their pricier, purer neighbours. It's about the same as the full bloods. There's no, there's no great differential in them. As for demand, AACO says the cheaper to run, cheaper to buy cattle come out way ahead. Our demand's very good. We see demand growing on the crossbred side of the business more so than on the full blood side of the business. The big opportunity, and, and this is what people have to understand, it's, it's in the, the F1 or the crossbred Wagyu production because that's where we can deliver... Um, a large chunk of high-quality beef. While full-blood producers like Pete Cabassi agree the major growth in the industry will come from the crossbreds, to get the best second-grade beef, you have to improve the quality at the top. And that's why developments in the feeding and breeding of 100% Wagyu are so important. It's always going to be a small part of the of the market, but it will be what I call the Formula One part of the market. <laughs>